Old Captain Bill Gustin with Miami Dade Fire Rescue Department for another one of our hump day hangouts. And I'm going to be joined by uh, some distinguished guests, and I'll let them introduce each other. I first would like to uh, thank Key, Key Hose, that's keyfire.com, uh, for their generous sponsorship of this uh, hangout. Um, that's an easy endorsement for me because that's the hose that we use on my company. And um, you can't do better than Key, uh, especially their combat ready, their top of the line. But any of the models of Key hose is going to be uh, exceptionally good in terms of uh, flow capabilities, in other words, low friction loss and kink resistance and a great balance of durability of <laughs> abrasion and heat resistance. So uh, if, you've, if you're considering replacing some hose in your department, uh, give Key a call, keyfire.com. You will not be disappointed. Before I make the introductions, I want to talk about what happened last week in Dallas, and I think it's very heavy on our hearts and our minds. Uh, we share a very special kinship with the police. I think that many of us have family members who are police officers. We work with the police officers very closely. Our job as firefighters would be chaos. It would be too dangerous to accomplish in many cases without the police. God bless the police. God bless them. And I'm asking everybody that is watching, pray for them and thank the police officers when you see them. God best bless the police. Mike, if you'd like to introduce yourself, tell a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is uh, Mike Dugan. I'm a retired captain from the city of New York. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be here with Bill uh, once a month talking to you all. And I have to say, as a former New York City police officer, before I became a smart police officer and became a fireman, uh, I uh, want to send my thoughts and prayers to the brothers in uh, Dallas to the members of law enforcement. Uh, it's a difficult job and it's getting a lot harder for them to do and I honestly believe um, they need our thoughts and prayers and they need our backup. And I know a lot of my friends in the fire service are telling every policeman, you know, the firehouse is a safe haven for them. Come in, use the bathrooms, take a break, no questions asked, no problems, have a meal, have a cup of coffee, whatever else. Uh, always welcome in a firehouse, and uh, I want the members of law enforcement to know that they were always welcome in a firehouse. Very good. Yeah, that, that is true. And they are our brothers. They are our brothers, and they are our sisters. Dan, my bald-headed brother from the Beltway. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, Dan Shaw. Uh, I'm a battalion chief in Fairfax County, Virginia. I'm also co-author of 25 Survive, and I think there's no shortage of uh, echoing both Bill and uh, Mike's comments about uh, with our PD brethren. My brother's a federal agent out in San Diego, so uh, I, I think that hits home with everyone. And uh, you know, I just had this conversation with our uh, local police commander yesterday of really just sharing that any one of our firehouses is their house anytime, any hour of the day, uh, because you know they have our back, we have our back. We do a lot of joint event uh, with, with them where we work in concert. So. Uh, that relationship always extends well beyond just when we were on an incident. And uh, it, absolute pleasure to be here to talk about what we're talking about today and looking forward to it. All right, Clark, and please, by the way, Clark, I want you to introduce your uh, your partner as well. Uh, yeah. Clark Lamping with the Clark County Fire Department here in southern Nevada. Most of you know us as Las Vegas. Um, 18 years on the job. I'm a captain of Station 11 right on Las Vegas Boulevard. And I brought with me today... Uh, Guy, we're celebrating a very special occasion today. This is Alberto Puentes. Go ahead, Alberto. My name is Alberto Puentes. I'm a rookie firefighter here with the uh, Clark County Fire Department. Uh, today is actually my last day of probation, uh, and I'm just happy to be here and uh, learn from all of you. I brought him on today because I want everyone to witness me firing him on live <laughs> on live internet. So, now he's a good guy, and I thought if we had any issues about training. Any of the hose lays or any of the rotary saw stuff we're talking about, if we have any issues of training, Alberto, who just got out of our academy, might be able to shed some light on what we do in our academy and the training he received. So, Okay, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, that's just great. And I, I don't think I need to tell you 
what a great fire department you are on. And, you know, just knowing some of the fellas, that rescue the other day where you guys put the ground ladder and the aerial ladder out for that swift water rescue, uh, with the, I think the girls were, were, were trapped out in the water, was absolutely fantastic. Uh, it made, made me proud to know you guys. So Thank you, sir. You are, you're, a, you're, it's a, you're on a great organization there, young man. You've got a very, very great future ahead of you. Thank you. And then uh, the oldest man in the room, second oldest man in the room, there, Bobby, did you like to say a few words for us? Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, congratulations, Alberto. Welcome to the uh, family. It's uh, great to have you on board. It's uh, going to be a great ride. Uh, I can't tell you how jealous I am uh, of your good fortune and, uh, and, uh, and, and all the promise that lays ahead of you. It's uh, absolutely probably uh, one of the most exciting times of your life, bar none, and uh, clearly uh, you've made a wonderful choice uh, of where to live and, and who to associate yourself with. One of the uh, one of the uh, primary things to always keep in mind is that if you esteem your own reputation, uh, it's better to be alone than in bad company. And you've uh, clearly made a great choice to be in good company uh, by uh, joining the Clark County Fire Department. Although I do have to question being on this hangout as. <laughs> maybe a, a slight slip up there. Uh, to echo Bill and Mike and uh, uh, Dan and everybody else, uh, uh, unbelievable, uh, just unbelievable tragedy uh, in Dallas on Thursday evening, uh, incomprehensible to most of us who uh, live and, and uh, work and love this, this country and, and, uh, and, and all its promise. Uh, can't think of a more uh, blatant assault on uh, American values and um, a, a more uh, heinous act, uh, I, I, it's hard to conceive. Uh, so I, I echo everyone else uh, thoughts and prayers with family and friends and the great city of Dallas and, and the entire nation um, as, as we come to grips with this uh, just this horrific uh, event, and, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll uh, not hopefully I, I know that we will uh, uh, rebound from it uh, stronger and more united and uh, more um, committed than ever to uh, the, the great promise of uh, of, the, of this uh, society of America. So that being said, Bill, let's talk about stretching short. Well, and. Um we don't like to stretch short, and I think we've spent several hangouts discussing ways to determine how to locate the fire, determine how much hose we're going to need, what path it's going to take, and how many firefighters it's going to take to advance that hose and where they need to be positioned strategically uh, on that hose line to keep it moving. Uh, and we've talked about that. Uh, on Mike Dugan spent many years on a truck company and one of his primary jobs uh, was to locate that fire for the engine. Uh, with an engine, you've got to know before you go. Where's the fire? How to reach it? How much hose? Which hallway? Which stairway? Uh, and then we need to, we're going to talk today about how to recover from stretching short. But before that, I think we all put our pants on the same way. Uh, we're all human, and we all make mistakes. Um, I'm going to relate a short stretch story myself. We got a call for a fire in a building in a public housing project. And these are two-story kind of barracks-type buildings. And there's quite a few of them. They're built around courtyards. And uh, we can see smoke showing. And when I'm the first company to arrive, but there's a staff car, a fire department staff car there. Uh, looks like a chief's car. And there was a, um, a, a, a firefighter, a, a fellow of the rank of firefighter, who was a somewhat of a, we called him special assistance. He was an adjutant to our uh, division chief. And uh, he made an arrival before me uh, and uh, told me that where the fire was and how much hose it would take to, to reach it. So I knew that it was going to take a stretch of about, according to him, 
about 400 feet of three inch line that we would connect to a Y and then from there uh, deploy uh, accordion bundle folds of uh, inch and three quarter hose. So something told me, can I trust this guy's judgment? Does he really know what he's talking about? And then I thought, well, if I don't, I'm going to hurt his feelings and humiliate him in front of everybody if I go ahead and walk ahead and take a look for myself. So I took his advice. I took his information, took command of the call, directed the companies to the entrance where we were going to stretch, teamed up companies to stretch the three-inch line, and we were hundreds of feet away from the fire. The third due engine took a different entrance into the complex, stretched to pre-connect right off their apparatus within 200 feet and put the fire out. And for a long time, I couldn't live that down because I want to be Mr. Nice Guy and didn't want to hurt this guy's feelings. I listened to him when I knew in the back of my head somewhere there was a little bird telling me, you better check yourself. So, know before you go, and be careful who you allow to do your size up for you. I've said this in previous calls. As much as we, we just talked about how we love the police, they're not firefighters. Don't let the police or civilians do your size up for you. Make sure that whoever is doing your size up for you, if it is not yourself, that you can count on. So anyway, that's my story. We never did recover from the short stretch because another engine company took our fire. And I heard about it for quite some time. So, Mike, have you got a favorite short stretch story for us that you'd like to share? Yes, I do, Phil. It was Christmas Eve night tour going into Christmas Day. Uh, an H-type building. So it's got two separate wings. And the building is shaped like an H. We go in the center court. They say the fire, the guy says the fire's up on my apartment, up on the, the sixth floor, top floor. So we go up there, and we go into the apartment, and there is smoke. And it's a, a decent smoke condition in this apartment. There's no fire. Well, unfortunately for us, the engine has a brand new boss. And because it's Christmas Eve night tour, most of the senior men are home with their families and everything else. They stretch up the stairway behind us. We get there, and my roof guy goes up the other stairs, because they're opposite stairs in the wings, goes up the other stairs and says, hey, I got the fire here on a top floor in the back wing, not the front wing. Well, I come out the door, and I see the engine, got the hose in the stairs, and... Again, um, maybe not the smartest thing I ever did, but I took my company up over the roof, had the guy, is the door still controlled in the fire apartment? He goes, yeah. I go, okay. We came down the stairs to the fire apartment and did our job, and we got in first due. The engine was shut out. They, they stretched the line, they charged the line, and they packed the line, and they never squirted a drop of water at fire. Um the senior man working that night tour was not did not have very much time on it again it was christmas eve uh but the young men in the engine company and the new boss learned quite a valuable lesson about you know wait even though it's wait until we know where it is unless you know exactly where you're going unless you have one staircase in the building and you see smoke on the fifth floor, if you have multiple staircases in the building, do not, do not, do not commit until you know where the fire is. It's a lot easier for the truck to move if there's a mistake made to get down and go back up someplace else than it is for that engine company with that hose line. Yeah, and it is no before you go. And it takes discipline on the part of your crew and it takes leadership on the part of the officer, and it takes self-control, mental toughness. And it takes practice, learning how to do it right, teaching you guys when you make a mistake, own your mistakes, and teach you guys what you did wrong, how you made a mistake. 
Yes, it's, it's, that's that's important. Uh, I know that w when I make a mistake, I sit the guys down the next morning at morning briefing, uh, right before breakfast, and say, "Hey, listen, you know, I'm I'm very quick to tell you when you screwed up. <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you I, I screwed up on this, and this is what I did wrong. And when I get an opportunity, if, if ever to do it again, uh, this is what I'm going to do different. So you learn from your mistakes and you make sure your crew learns from your mistakes and call it out. If you have a group of young guys, they're following you. They'll follow you anywhere. Uh, they either don't know that you made the mistake or they're too polite to tell you that you made a mistake. So you're not doing these young guys any favor by screwing up and then trying to cover it up. You know, they, they'll, they'll learn from you and they'll end up repeating <clears throat> that same bad behavior. So, uh, see, Clark... Are you Clark's muted or Dan? You want to go ahead and go with your short stretch? Sure, sure, absolutely. Yeah. I think we. Oh. <laughs> I think we all have a commonality there. They all seem to be uh, these multiple family dwellings, these garden style apartments. But uh, I, I feel pretty fortunate that the uh, the shortest and most embarrassing stretch I ever had was the first fire I ran when I was uh, in Howard County, Maryland. Uh, and my the, the hardest transition was that. Uh, I was stretching like I was still operating on a sterile uh, training ground of the fire academy and where we practice. And that's why I applaud as a sidebar a lot of these academies you see that put in these obstacles in front of their burn buildings and different things so it, it becomes more realistic for that trainee probie to transition into the reality of what we face in our garden apartments and residential structures and such uh, to overcome that. And so I was really focused on the speed and not so much the execution and implementation of the hose line. So as soon as we pulled up, four-story garden-style apartment, typical in the uh, the East Coast, and they were in this region in the Mid Atlantic. Uh, yeah, and there was 15 cars parked in the parking lot. There was a row of trees. There was a fence leading up to it. There's a door going to the enclosed stairwell. Fires on the third floor. So of course, you know, in my mind, I'm all about the speed. It's the speed of what we've been working on the entire time. So as soon as that rig is coming to a stop, I'm off the thing like a rocket take the line off the rig, make the start making a stretch of a 300-foot line. I think it was 300-foot line to make it up to the third floor. I almost guarantee I caught every tire in every car going up that uh, up the parking spots. I was jamming hose lines underneath there. Probably yanked that thing around every tree I could find. I was convinced I had, had chalked that door as I went through it, but I did not. Uh, and as soon as I made that second floor, that's when you know I started to pay attention to my surroundings and recognize I really had nothing on my shoulder really anymore. It became incredibly light. And just about that time is when that line, as I can only assume, is when that door closed and the entry level on that line, that that thing yanked off my shoulder, and I watched in slow motion as the nozzle went up in the air and fell right down the well hole. Uh, and just about that time as a savvy officer who's who's, you know, uh, 20 plus years, taught some of our, uh, our, our our firefighter one class, comes up, out of breath, panting, just for him to see the look on my face, and I see the look of disappointment on his face of, why are you running, and now we have to make up for all this, and it really goes back to, I wish I could remember where I read it, it was a quote, or a reference to uh, leadership, and you talked about hose line leadership, it's something we often underestimate is, and understand in leadership that 5% of leadership is really just the articulation of the order, and 95% of that is uh, the implementation and the execution and completion of the order. And I was focused solely on the 5%. The order is to get that line up there and not really in the process to get to there. So much to what Mike was saying, and I always like this with one of our uh, fellow instructors of traditions always says, uh, Sammy Hiddle, is that you know, there's a difference between drilling and training. Uh, we, you know, I was trained well. I just didn't, I had not started drilling on the fine intricacies of estimating the stretch and knowing that parking uh, spots are 10 feet long so you can figure out how many cars will tell you how long the stretch is and making sure you're not, almost like if you're a tillerman, you're not outrunning your tillerman with your tractor. I had to go is the same speed as my backup man, but my backup man couldn't catch up to me. And so, you know, it ended in a, a significant failure of not getting the line in place. And fortunately, because you know, what I love about the engine company, the team concept, the three other guys picked up my failures and were able to you know, execute. And it was a good life lesson. Like I said, I was very glad it was the first fire I ever ran as a very young firefighter. Uh, but that's stuck in my mind for you know, until today. Still the same exact lesson I, I think about every single time because we are human and we do make errors. So really focus on that 95%, which is the 
execution and completion of, of that order is really key and, and the, the, the manner in which we get to that point. Dan, you made a good point that there is a difference when you really look at it between training and drilling. Um, and I, I think that uh, one of the, the leading reasons for stretching short is that we have so many firefighters that train and have been trained in a training tower. Training towers don't usually have hallways. I, I'm very proud to say my department's training tower does have hallways. But in a training tower, you know, two or three lengths and boom, you're there. You know, one length for the floor below, one length on the stairs, and one length right there in the, at the fire landing. Boom, you're there, three lengths. Well, you keep doing that over and over and over and over again, and if you predicate your standpipe stretches on three lengths, uh, you're, you're more than likely going to come stretch short on a, uh, uh, on a real fire. Uh, I... I when, when we drill, we drill in the parking garage uh, across the street at the rapid transit station because we can simulate hallways. We can simulate long stretches. Can't do that in a training tower. Well, and to your point, Bill, I mean, it's, if you look at, like, training tower designs, I mean, think about most people's training towers. How wide is the stairwell? I know the ones we have, you could bring a baby grand down that thing. Yeah. But what's the reality in the, in the places we run? You put two firefighters side by side, and then throw some smoke and superheated environment, and then these two yelling at each other because they can't understand each other, and now conditions are changing, and that's the reality of you're going to come up short because now you can't see the hose line you have. You better estimate the stretch properly because you have that uh, institutional knowledge of your first two area. But, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, that, that, that real segue is training is the imprinting of that skill set, and then that drilling is just hammering down and getting the sets and reps and then start incre increasing those stressors so – your environment that you're drilling in is matching the environment you're going to go to. And you can start putting those external stressors in there so that you come back to what you trained on, those imprinted skills, but now you have that adaptability to recognize this is a little bit different and I have to adapt to it based upon the skill set I have. Yeah, and one of the most realistic things is um, panicky people coming down uh, a stairway, clogging the stairway, uh, a certain amount of smoke in the stairwell, and uh, uh, people that are uh, physically unfit, elderly people, people crying for help, uh, people carrying their bird cages and their flat screen TVs down the stairs, and they're getting in your way. That's why I am not, and that's why my department is not real big on flaking a lot of uncharged lines in the stairwell before we charge it. You know, the idea you can flake it to the floor, half landing above, or the floor above, and then you'll have gravity. That's fine, unless you're competing with a lot of people. You have any amount of smoke in that stairway, you're better off just laying it all out on the floor below and charging it. But we, we've discussed that before. But th those are some of the stressors. You, you want some stretch at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you got people running down the stairs, uh, and you're trying to stretch a line up the stairs. Uh, Mr. Lamping, Captain Lamping, sir. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> I had a situation several years ago. We pulled up, and it was a single. It was a, it's, it's even more embarrassing because it was a single-story, single-family, ranch-style home. Bread-and-butter situation, fire in the back, and it just so happened that we had a deputy chief was on scene who just happened to be in the area and responded to the fire. The deputy chief went around the Charlie side and said, Hey, let's bring a line into the Charlie side. We pulled up, second in, pulled the e-brake, and my firefighters took that line off, uh, cross light, pre-connect, cross light, inch and three-quarter, and they went immediately down the Bravo side before I got a chance to do my at least a 270 or 360, but I was going to do a 270, and they decided to go down the Bravo side. They were moving the line well, so I didn't say anything. I didn't try to stop the firefighters. Well, it turns out this person stored every single one of his belongings that didn't go inside of his house on the Bravo side of his home. So we had wheelbarrows, we had toolboxes, we had bicycles, we had every single thing you could imagine that would catch up a hose line on the Bravo side of the house. So three quarters of the way through the stretch, we are hung up on everything. We are working, all four of us now, even my engineer is trying to help push this hose through this junk pile of belongings as we're trying to make it to the Charlie side. I'm towards the nozzle. I make eye contact with the deputy chief, and he sees the trouble I'm having. And so his next call is, 
next company in, bring me an inch and three quarter down the delta side of the structure, please. The delta side of the structure had a basketball court on it, concrete, wide open stretch. Company follows us up, pulls in, and takes their inch and three quarter right down the basketball court, no obstructions, all the way to the Charlie side and starts putting water on the fire. And the division chief or the deputy chief was a friend of mine. I've got a lot of respect for him. He didn't mean to embarrass me over the air, but it was absolutely embarrassing when he gave us an assignment and we couldn't accomplish the assignment, so on the air, he was forced to give that assignment to another company. Um, and it was, and it was, I placed all the blame on myself. I did not do my due diligence. I did not do my 270 uh, observations, so it was all me. I should have stopped the hose line. I should have told the firefighters to wait. We had some young guys really, really aggressive. I should have told them, stop, let's take a look before we start running hose. I did not do that, and it was, again, just like everyone else said, it was embarrassing, and it was a lesson for me, absolutely. We no longer run off the engine with hose before we take a look at what, we're, what we have. All right, Alberto, I've watched uh, many a YouTube video on your training. First of all, training in 120 degrees is uh, a challenge in of itself. Uh, so I know that you do scenario-based training. You, can you bring something to the table? Did you make a mistake? Were you part of a mistake while you were in your training? Uh, and how did you learn from that mistake? Uh, well, sir, we uh, definitely made a lot of mistakes during our academy, and I think that's one of the best ways we learned is uh, through our mistakes. You know, you learn about what you do, and uh, and you definitely learn from them. Um, with regards to uh, the subject we're talking about today, uh, stretching hose lines, we did train on a tower style, um, a burn tower. So there wasn't any hallways, as uh, you were referring to. Uh, and we still made uh, a lot of critical mistakes. It has uh, two or three rooms on the uh, first floor. Um, and uh, when we stretched, they did try to make some obstacles for us before we got to the front door. And a lot of us uh, did get hung up on that. So uh, we definitely uh, came up sort short a couple of times with those obstacles being in our way. But we definitely learned from and, uh, and overcame uh, those uh, those challenges. And now we we know to uh, to definitely wait for uh, for instruction or, or you know make sure we have a clear picture of where we're going to go and, and and advance that hose line. How old are you, Alberto? Twenty four, sir. You know I, I hear a lot of talk about you know the younger generation, the millennials, and uh, I think we're painting with a broad brush. We say well they don't have the skills, they don't have the character. I reject that. I reject that. I have a son that's 31 years old. I work with guys that are in their 20s, and they're every bit as good a character of a man as my dad was, as, as I was. At that. In fact, they're better firemen at their stage in their career than I was at that stage. And uh, I think we've got a lot of good people. And I think you're looking at Alberto's one of them. Uh, Alberto, you know, you're, you're, you're probably never going to be in better shape in your life. Uh, training in 120 degrees is going to test your metal. Obviously, you passed that test, uh, but your career is just beginning. And uh, I hope that you, for the rest of your career, keep the fire service in your heart and in your head, because it is more than just a job. How about this uh, Halston or that uh, Halston guy? Uh, oh, Halton, Halton. I'm sorry. I thought it was that. Uh, uh, I know he was introduced. It's a it's a private joke. He was inter he was uh, interviewed on MSNBC like anybody ever watches MSNBC uh, when they had the fire on New Year's Eve in Dubai and the guy whoever was interviewing him kept referring to him as Chief Halston. So that's why I call him Halston. But it is Halton. Do you have a an embarrassing story? So you can bury your soul like the rest of us. Well, I got I have two. Both very quick. So as a young rookie firefighter, uh, we roll out. I don't know. It was probably one of my earliest, you know, fires. A reverse lay, and I failed to put the hose clamp, and I filled the entire bed of two and a half with water when I opened the plug. And I remember, I remember the second I turned from the plug, watching the line, you know, coming to life, and realizing what I had done. But in that second, there's no recovery. You've done it. And, you know, the classic ribbing that came from it and uh, all. But <clears throat> fast forward uh, 
15 years later, 20 years later, a fire comes in, and, and we all become creatures of habit. Dan said it very well, habit and, and, and training. <clears throat> this goes to a, a very common uh, issue that many of us struggle with in the fire service, and I, we, we all call it the pre-connect mindset, right? And we all we all struggle with it because they're so quick to load, and you know, you go to 300 fires, and you you pull it. 20 minutes later, there's a wet spot on the ground. Job's done. You load it, and and so it becomes a a piece of who you are. <clears throat> fire comes in. It's on uh, uh, I think it was Grand Grand Boulevard, if I'm not incorrect on in the location. Um, it's a commercial fire. People streaming out the door. Smoke rolling out the top of the door. Obvious working fire. Inch and three quarter pre connect. You know, try to make that quick knockdown. The building I should probably identify as a super Walmart. Got about to the cash registers when that was it. 200 feet in a super Walmart is nothing. The job of the first two engine is the standpipe, not the not the you know not not advancing the initial attack line. So you know pre-connect pre -connect mindset, uh, you know a lack of uh, uh, lack of focus and attention for whatever reasons, or whatever was going on, anybody can fall prey to, to <clears throat> those particular uh, uh, traps. What, what's what's important really is how you deal with it, what you take away from it, what you learn from it, and how you deal with it in the moment. You know, uh, if you're the boss, do you jump down somebody's throat for doing that, or or do you do what we're doing now? Say, oh, that's nothing, kid. You know, when when I was when I was on the rig, here's what I did. Uh, you bare your soul and say, what would you take away from it? Um, you know, we'll, we'll always remember much more fondly how somebody treated us when we screwed up than how they treated us when we hit a home run. Uh, so I, I'll remember, you know, fondly how I got treated, and uh, it, was, uh, it was good. So anybody can do that, but the, the big problems there were repetition. It had always worked, pre-connect pre mindset. And just the failure to assess the situation properly, failure to assess the stretch, uh, just you know, just going on autopilot, and, and uh, got taken over. You know, boss, you uh, mentioned something, uh, and it's it's actually one of the steps to uh, to avoiding stretching short, and that is when you're uh, stretching a hose line into a commercial occupancy. The front entrance or the address entrance a lot of times is not the shortest way to the fire. And it's not the safest way to the fire. And if you take a look at some of these NIOSH reports and you look at the the route that some of these hose lines have taken through turnstiles of a, a grocery store in and around tables and chairs and and, and uh, like a serpentine, and then eventually get to the fire. And remember, the the deeper you go in, the more hose you're going to need. The deep, further you are you're away, you are from your means of egress. The more air you're going to use, the greater chance you're going to be separated from your your crew, or you could be caught in a flashover or a backdraft. So, in a commercial, there's, there's a good chance we're not going to be taking that hose line in the front entrance door. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we're being uh, sponsored by Key. Um, when you do get an, op uh, an opportunity to try the Key, uh, do not rely on theoretical coefficient um, hydraulic calculations or something that you're going to find in a, a, a book or a chart unless it's specifically for the Key Combat Ready Hose. Otherwise, if you if you do, you are going to terribly overpressurize the line, overflow it, and it will be hard to manage. Uh, for case in point, I happen to know that Key Combat Ready in a 50-foot section of inch and three-quarter has a friction loss of 25 psi per 100 feet at 185 gallons a minute. Now, if you take a look at a, a, a if you figure that out by using a coefficient mathematically, or if you figured out that friction loss based upon a generic hose from some manual or slide chart, you're going to be grossly overpressurizing that hose line. So, um, uh, you, you and and the thing about with 
you get the argument, well, if we don't pressurize the hose line sufficiently or at a high pressure, we'll have kinks. That's not going to be the case with the key hose. You, you're going to have to really make an effort to kink that hose. So I, I, I can't swear by it enough. Uh, you actually have to go out of your way to try to kink key hose even at low pressure. So I also I want to say something else here too. I want to give a shout out to my department, Miami Dade Fire Rescue Department. We've recently produced two training videos that are on the fire engineering fire engineering website. One was on a fireman service produced by my dear friend uh, uh, Captain Mike Posner. Uh, just scratching the surface. It's kind of like a training minute, about maybe a four or five minute video on the utilization of fireman service for uh, the phase one and phase two elevator operation. The other one is a very impressive uh, video on uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Very intelligently done, very professionally done. Uh, I'm very proud uh, of my department for doing these things and I encourage everybody to go to the fire engineering website and avail yourself to those videos. Now, um, now that we've talked about stretching short, and we talked about avoiding stretching short by knowing where we go, maybe not taking the the the, uh, the closest the door that uh, is the main entrance if it happens to be a commercial. Let's talk about recovering. Uh, the way I look at it, there's three things you can do. Uh, you could be honest and. You may have to get on the radio and say, hey, I blew it. I can't reach the fire. You're, another company is going to have to stretch and just set down the line and go help the other company. The second is extend the hose from the source. In other words, a standpipe outlet, a Y that is out in the um, uh, clear air or on the floor below, or the discharge of the fire apparatus. That's one way, at the source. The other is at the nozzle, and you would utilize a uh, breakaway nozzle where you could unscrew the tip, and have inch and, uh, a half thread, you could add some hose, you could use an increaser uh, that would be inch and a half female by two and a half uh, male if it happens to be two and a half inch hose. Uh, there's there's different ways of doing this, just unscrewing the nozzle and adding more hose. I think it's an important for firefighters to have the skill of adding hose at the nozzle and adding hose at the source, but even more important to recognize the conditions when each one of those tactics is indicated and conversely when the other opposite one is is could be dangerous or very ineffective. I'm not a big fan of extending hose at the nozzle in an untenable atmosphere. Uh, I know that there's advantages to that. I know that there's a lot of people who teach that, but that idea that you're unscrewing a tip and you're trying to screw something else back on, it's just, it's just something I'm not comfortable with. Uh, adding it to the source or in clear air, yes, you, it's going to take you more people to advance more hose. Again, yes, it will. Uh, you'll have to reposition your mules on the stairs, but the advantage is, is that you can see what the heck you're doing. Regardless, you're going to be shutting the water supply off to that crew, so that it's incumbent on that crew to put themselves somewhere in an area of refuge. And it also is incumbent on us to practice the methods and, uh, and how quickly we can deploy that. So that's just a couple of thoughts on my part. Uh, Mike, what are, what are your thoughts on extending the hose line? Before we get to extending the hose line, Bill, I just want to make something just so all of our listeners um, have um, a thought process here. In the FDNY, and again, it's the FDNY, you are not allowed to stretch an inch and three quarter into a commercial building. Okay, you're going to go with the two and a half. For a store, a taxpayer, or something else, you're going to bring big water. Okay, because again, there are a lot of places that are pre-connect, they're married to their pre-connects. We are not. 
we use um, breakable lines depending on where we go. Every line is a static line depending on the uh, how many lengths of inch and three quarter are the lead lengths, and then it's filled out with two and a half. We do not, do not, do not ever bring an inch and three quarter into a commercial structure. We are going to bring that two and a half, and it's going to be a blitz line that we will break when we have enough hose line to get where we've got to be. And again, we're not going to stretch before we get there. So it's real important that we understand that. Did they have a fire? I, I, I got distracted there for a minute. My full, full disclosure, to back up Mike's comment, we had the same exact policy. Well, fellas, um, one of the worst tragedies in the history of this fire service that happened uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, and I am not demeaning that department at all. They've made some huge advances because the fact of the matter is, is uh, at, at that time, uh, my department and a lot of departments would have would have done the same thing. But being outrun and outgunned, and um, it's yes, we have a, a we. There's still many a department that has fights every fire the same way. They pull up, they pull a 200 foot pre-connected inch and three quarter line and start operations off their booster tank. And you know what happens? 99% of the time they put the fire out, they pat themselves on the back, praising themselves that they did a great job and it just reinforces that bad behavior until sooner or later their luck runs out. And and Bill, excellent point. Point well taken. When their luck runs out, we name it wall bombs. We name it the super sofa, the Charleston Nine. We name it. Uh, we can go on and on. Hack and stack Ford. Whatever else it is, we name the fires where they don't go right. Okay, because we've lost our brothers. And Bill, to your point, I mean that—that's the—I uh, mean that, that's where that term normalization of deviance really finds its roots. Is that you know I've done this for this long and nothing bad's ever happened. So what would be my catalyst to change my behavior? Uh, and that's where we go back to our training. And I'm you know I'm glad Mike and and uh, Bill and, and you guys are talking about the two and a half. You know, I often ask a lot of our probationary firefighters when they come out because there's. If there's not a connection between your recruit training and your field operations people, well, there's an assumption, it's a natural human bias, that you, you who come out into the field to me in the operations have the same level of knowledge and uh, expectations that I have for myself. Whereas this person may not have that background, or maybe they didn't have a grandfather and father in the fire service. So their only imprinting is what they learn in recruit school would be very basic knowledge. And at two and a half is where you see that greatest disparity. Because you ask them, hey, when do you deploy a two and a half? And the common answer is a big fire. So what is a big fire for a guy with two months on a job versus a, what is a big fire for someone with 25 years in a job? So whether you adopt like Andy Frederick's adults, uh, you know, acronym to go through that, is that here's my triggers for when I use a two and a half, or you have a policy like Chief Halton or Mike does where, hey, you're always going to do this, then that normalization of deviance becomes the expectation because that's what people are going to do. They're going to raise the level of expectation or drift, drift down to your level of tolerance. And so that level of tolerance is going to be that, well, nothing bad's ever happened, so I'll deploy an inch and three quarter every single time. So you know, a lot of that goes back again to learning from those fires Mike just talked about and looking at those key points and saying, these weren't bad firefighters. These are good firefighters that made one bad critical decision or someone made a bad critical decision because the one thing we, we miss in all this in the fire service is we can have the greatest plan, but we forget that the fire always has a vote. And the fire could care less whether you're a paid volunteer, big, small, you didn't learn on a two and a half. And we have to always be a, have that adaptability and be efficient in the way that we adapt to challenging that fire because it doesn't care and we have to overcome that obstacle and that, that comes back to a lot of the stuff we talk about with the hose lines is that if we don't have a plan in place then failure is going to be the option you're going to probably find because you're thinking that the fire is going to say oh, okay well, they stretch short I'll go ahead and give them a break while they figure out what plan B is 
or they didn't pull the two and a half. So having, you know, we, we look at hose line operations much like you do with forcible entry. If you get to a door, you have plan A through Z. If plan A doesn't work, you don't drop your tool and walk away. You go to plan B and plan C. The same with hose line operations. So it, I'm a pre-connect fire department. And I absolutely agree is, you know, when we go to 25 to survive, it's one of the classes or questions we ask. How long is your pre-connect? Unequivocally, it's 200 feet. Why is it 200 feet? Because it's always been 200 feet and nothing bad's ever happened, so we have it. Whereas, you know, we want to match that, that apparatus to the people we serve. And so, if, if you had a community of single story or two story colonials with an acre land and now they're 15 inward facing garden style apartments with a 400 foot setback, then we have to adapt to that. So it's, it really is the ability to have some adaptability and, and match what we have and understand that when we do have these long lines, I absolutely agree with you. If, if we don't train and drill in that environment that, all right, you came up short, what are you going to do? What's plan A? You know, plan A might be, uh, we, you know, our default for us typically a lot of times is we'll have the driver do it because that's a guy dressed in a uniform. He can move quicker than we can. So he can deploy the front bumper line out, take off the nozzle, disconnect the, the cross lay from the pony sleeve, connect it, and bam, we got instantly an extra 100 feet. But that coordination for that that work on the fire ground takes months of drilling, sitting at the kitchen table, hammering out the specifics, and then practicing it. Because if one thing is off, like the guy's making a stretch, he's in zero visibility, he says we're going to do a longer line, he doesn't know the driver's going to disconnect it. He gets some laxity in the line, and he makes a push. Now you have a driver chasing a line across a, a you know across the yard, trying to connect it, and it's just one part that's out of there. So, uh, I mean, it, it's easy to think of in the, in the global. You know, let's break it down to kitchen table and talk about our plans. But it really does come down to that execution of the way we train every single day in a firehouse. So it's not arbitrary, and it's focused on hey, what are we going to do for this? Because when you can't come to the back of the engine and say, all right, we came up short or this is a long stretch and just yell out Omaha as your audible and think everyone's going to know what you're talking about. you got to have the ability to say, all right, if Omaha is the 400-foot line where we attach two pre-connects, great, whatever you want to call it. But have that hammered out beforehand so that everyone knows what it is. And I would add, know your hydraulics. There's a point of diminishing returns when you start especially when you start exceeding 300 feet on inch and three-quarter line. So you got to know what you're doing at your pump panel because that's not going to be a normal situation. So you've got to, if you're going to do that, make sure that your training looks to be what, what is going to be your, <clears throat> your friction loss, what do you need to do with your, at your pump panel. Um, it, it, inch and three-quarter beyond 300 feet gets to be a pretty interesting discussion. It does, but I'm going to give another plug for keyholes. 25 pounds friction loss. Did you see how I just got that in there, boss? Smooth like butter. Real smooth. <laughs> <laughs> remember, 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 remember too, and my friends at Keel back me up on this, every hose is different, so make sure you check your liner. Make sure don't go with somebody telling you 25 pounds or 35 pounds. Get out your flow meter, get your pitot gauge, calibrate your flow meter, put it on the intake side, flow your lines, Make sure you know flow. Flow is what's important, not pressure. We pressure test our lines every year so that they don't burst. Big deal. Nobody's operating at 400 psi on a hand line anyway. But the, the really important thing is, is what is that friction loss? And even when you purchase hose brand new out of the package, if if the liner is different, or uh, you know if you've got a blue liner or a yellow liner, you can have a completely different friction loss issue. So no, no test, 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 and test again and repeat your tests. Do them constantly. The worst thing that can happen is you become more proficient at, at loading and reloading your hose and you become more proficient at stretching and you get a greater understanding of the basic hydraulics that, that, that regulate our industry. Um, so, you know, be careful when people tell you this is the friction loss. Always, it, 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 you know, always double check. Question everything. Well, and to your point, I mean, we're, we're talking about five numbers. If you think right. about most engine companies uh, in the United States, I mean, this is where you want to build that pride and prestige in your rig, uh, and, and I'm, I'm absolutely with you. I mean, I wish we would 
almost get rid of that of pressure testing and go with flow testing because that's where you would determine if your pumps are coming aging or if you have some delamination in your hose lines. But if we go out and we do this, you know, what we did for hours, we would uh, intake and then discharge, we have flow meters. And so we would flow every line. And so the idea was for these five hose lines, front bumper line, two cross lays, and the lines coming off the back, you would say, all right, for, if you're riding my beloved engine, the five numbers you have to know as a backup man is this is what the nozzle reaction is for each one of these lines. And here's the flow we're going to get out of this, and this is the friction loss for each one of those. So now you're starting to build that esprit de corps within your rig, but now every single one of us is a hydraulic engineer when you ride an engine. And so if you're the nozzleman, you know what that flow feels like. If you're the backup firefighter, you know how much pressure you have to give that firefighter on the nozzle because you know what line he pulled. You've done this beforehand. And if you're the captain, you can look at your, your book for every year and say, wow, you know, the, the second cross lay, we're seeing diminishing flow in that every single year because we're doing flow testing. Something's either going on with that piping or that hose line. We need to do a little more inspection in that. Well, the other thing to remember, those are great points. The other thing to remember, especially when we talk about front bumper loads or, or rear loads, find out where the pickup sensor is uh, for that particular load. It's supposed to be four inches from the discharge, but routinely we find them just off the manifold. So you could have a Rube Goldberg plumbing uh, contest go into that front bumper load with, with 80s and 90s and uh, 180s before it gets to that discharge. And the other thing to remember too, especially in your pre-connects, you've got that chick swan. Now the chick swan, the interior diameter of that is an inch and an eighth. So that's a reducer. So you've got to be aware of these things. And then the final thing is people always tell me, oh, we have a flow meter built into our, our engine has a flow meter on it. Well, in order to have a, an accurate flow meter, it's got to have four times the diameter of that, uh, of that pipe in laminar flow before it hits that paddle wheel, because that's how they work. And very rarely do you find anything specked out to, to that level of, of accuracy. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go into understanding hydraulics, and there's a lot of uh, misconception and, and, and misperception out there. So make sure that your A, your rigs are spec correctly, make sure you know what your pickup sensors are, and then and then put put flow meters, put pressure gauges in the hose bed at the connection, put them every fifty or hundred feet and see what's going on, you know, intelligently with your line and, and, and measure and test. And I just want one other thing because I think Dan brought up something so important. As you're doing this and you're testing with the flows, your people become aware of what the hose is telling you as you're holding your specific hose on your specific engine. And now that nozzle person, the backup person, will say, we don't have enough, we're not getting enough water yet. There's something wrong because I do not feel the same thing I've always felt. There is a kink, there is a door closed on the line, there is something wrong here and they can communicate that to the officer and to the uh, pump operator. Mike Dugan, I am a, a big fan of inline gauges, but if I will take the opinion and the judgment out of, uh, uh, of an experienced firefighter on my, off, on my nozzle, if I'm telling him, okay, you're good, we're at 110 PSI at the inline gauge, and he's telling me we got a crap, crap screen cap, I'm not going to tell them, well, we're reading the right pressure. Negative, negative. We're going to do whatever we have to do. First thing we're going to do is we're going to look for kinks, and we're going to look for if there's a door closed on the hose. Uh, another point I wanted to make out is, and this is get back to some of Bobby's uh, points, know your flows. Determine your target flows. Uh, I wouldn't, uh, for an interior firefighting, I wouldn't go below 150 gallons per minute. Uh, my department is 185. Determine that based, of course, on your nozzle, your friction loss in your hose, uh, in, in your target gallon per minute. Uh, but also, once you've done that, and once you've determined that, then I want you to take a, and put a 90 degree kink in that hose line and see if that target pressure gives you some element some degree of safety in terms of flow you still get some appreciable flow with a 90 degree kink in the line so that should be your criteria as well because kinks are pretty hard to avoid Clark uh, just in our last few minutes uh, <coughs> is there a specific 
In fact, let me, uh, let me defer to our young compatriot there. Uh, how did they uh, teach you to extend hose lines on the academy? Well, they taught us uh, both ways. You know, we either have reverse lays or we have our pre-connects. Um, but, you know, you want to make sure you have a clear path of, to where you're going. And there's two loops from our cross lay, so we uh, just pull the cross lay off and just advance towards uh, towards our destination, sir. And that's the green to the flat lay. Yes, sir. Yeah, and a lot of us use use a uh, something similar. We use a triple layer. Uh, I know that uh, uh, I believe you guys use uh, Minuteman, which I really like. Because I like a hose load, especially in the district where I work, because we have so many additions in the back we have to stretch around to. Um, I like a hose that plays off your um, your forearm uh, or off your shoulder. Uh, you just have to know your limitations. And the other thing is, I think by now in your in your uh, early in your career, you recognize what are hose magnets. That is where a vehicle tire. In the pavement, meet fence posts uh, are, are another hose magnet. So um, those are all things, and that and it comes with experience, and of course it comes with, with with the training as well. Because none of us, none of us, are going to that many fires that we're going to be proficient just by by duty, uh, by fire duty. Clark, any other thoughts on uh, where where do you ex extend? You came up short. Where do you extend the hose line? I actually I have a question that I'd like to propose to the board, and I know it's late. We only have five minutes left, and I'm going to open a huge can of worms here. But, you know, on the initial hose stretch, there's a lot going on in the fire scene. There's a lot of radio traffic, okay? We come up short. How difficult is it for us to communicate via the radio that we're short and we need to implement our backup plan if we have a specific backup plan? How are we going to do it in my, in my department? It's going to be impossible if I'm going to get on the radio and try to give specific instructions on, I need you to shut the standpipe down, I need you to give me 100 extra feet on the standpipe so we can extend that, or I need you to bring me up 100 feet of dry hose to the nozzle we're going to connect it. That radio traffic is not going to go out in the initial stages of a fire attack on my department. The radio is too, too busy. I'd just like to know what we're doing in Miami, what we're doing in New York, what we're doing in Virginia to come up with a plan? Is it a specific plan like Chief Shaw said? Is it Omaha and everyone knows what Omaha is? Or are there different variations of Omaha? Can we do this without talking on the radio? Uh, I would be real interested. We might have to do this next next month or so, but I would be real interested to see how we implement this plan in not only low visibility, but with very little radio direction. What do you think, Cap? Yes, and here, here's the other thing. You know that a, a close evolution is going south. When you hear radio traffic such as we need more hose. We need more hose. At the, at, at the height of all the radio traffic and the hose line is not getting to the fire. It is incumbent on the incident commander, whether that be the first arriving company officer or that be a command officer, one of the first determinations of an ongoing size up is, is the hose line in position and operating? And if it isn't, why isn't it? Did they take the wrong door? Do they have a forcible entry problem? Do they have a staffing problem? Did they stretch short? What is it that we're not getting water on that fire? Find out why and let's create uh, correct the problem. Uh, any closing thoughts, fellas? Uh, starting with you, Bobby. We're about ready to say goodbye for the afternoon. Yeah, I, I, would, I would make two quick comments when we talk about stretching, which I think is important. One is that if you are going to extend a stretch, uh, try to put a bigger line on, uh, you know, go, go with the two and a half and then take it down your inch and three quarter. Secondly, if you want to read a really great piece, uh, old piece, but still a great piece, it's called the two and a half inch hand line. It was by Andy Fredericks. You can go to fireengineering.com, put it in the search engine, and pull up probably one of the best articles ever written. Also, you know, when we're talking about heat release rates today and we're talking about uh, everything that we're talking about in terms of uh, looking at fire behavior and such, we know that the fires, although classically people will say they're hotter, they're not hotter, they're just uh, releasing their energy exponentially faster. They're not any hotter, That's, that despise the laws of physics, but they, they are growing and releasing their energy much more readily, so it, it, it would be 
incumbent upon us to remember that although a target flow rate of 150 or 180 gallons a minute is great, with our two and a half inch line, we can target a flow rate of between 250 and 325 with with you know minimal effort and not not that much more effort and and obviously much more effective against today's modern fire behavior. Uh, and boss, there's another point: the reach. You don't have to get nose to nose with the fire on a commercial paint and body shops. You, you operate the thing right at the overhead door. You can operate it from a flanking position. You don't have to get inside near the fire, inside the fire building. You can knock down most of the fire right from the doorway because of the reach with two and a half. Mike, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I just think um, the one thing uh, just to talk to uh, about what Clark said about stretching short, in the city of New York, that's an urgent message. It's not a May Day that a fireman's in trouble that we have a problem. That's an urgent message. Loss of water, stretching short, problem getting water on the fire. During an urgent message, unless you have a May Day, you are not to communicate on the radio. Not back the rig up another 10 feet, get me a portable ladder. All of that is done face-to-face -face now because we are correcting the problem. We have radio discipline, and we are going to take that radio discipline and make it make it part of it. We will also listen to the fire afterwards, and if my company violated the rules on the urgent, we're going to have a little bit of a drill with the chief coming by to see us to talk about our radio discipline. You know, uh, 123 show for the 123. Hey, boss, listen, uh, I got the cooler and the water for you when you come out in case you're getting dehydrated. You know, um... Uh, we're gonna. The deputy is gonna be stopping by to have a drill at the firehouse. Okay, um, it's it's really important that the because listen, I'm a truck guy, but the fires don't go out with the truckies. We need the water, we need the line, we need the engine. So we have to get that line and all of those communications around that have to take priority. Everything else is shut up, and l let's get the line fixed first. Any closing thoughts, uh, Dan? Uh, I'm still just speechless that a truckie just said that the engine's the only reason the fires go out. I, just want, to, I want to capture that for a minute and let it soak in. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, a, a couple things in there, and to Clark's point, um, to, to really share with him, and this is one of the key things we put in our policy, is that the job of all the other engine companies that arrive on the fire, before they touch a hose line and stretch it, is to make sure the first line is in operation. Because three or four lines that are too short and not in operation are useless. So you know, one of the things we just in semantics we changed is that we don't call uh, the back call it a backup line. It's a second line that can perform the function of backup. Just a change of words, but it's really to start hammering in and get that imprint in the guys to understand is that that is a hose line that may perform as a backup function. So that is one of the uh, the key parts. And to a point that Chief Halton made, I think is, is excellent, is that we should always, as engine company members, especially when we're talking about it in anything we do, uh, you know, as we talk about this generational change, is that you are responsible for leaving a legacy, and you're responsible for educating that next generation. So always challenge those conventional thoughts so that you can understand and educate the why of what we do, because if we don't, then we'll have generations that have no idea why we do this. And a perfect example of that is to use the other why word, the W-Y-E, in our hose line operations and challenge that conventional thought of why do we use these all the time? Um, because we always have, and, that, and that's a whole other conversation that I think is fantastic. And, you know, and I'm a big fan of uh, getting rid of those, but that's my own personal thought. And really what it comes down to is, uh, you know, the judge of our character as an engine company member really is how we act in that face of adversity and when we have a failure. And we understand that failure is not an option when, just like Mike said, the engine has to do their job or the fire is not going to go out. So it's your ability to be able to face that adversity and be adaptable and how you're going to overcome that. Well, Mike, Dugan, you were right. We did not touch on saws. We're going <laughs> to touch on saws next month and if we don't get to it next month there's always the month after that there's no limit on this and uh, I think we could we talk about a lot of engine stuff in here and because there is a lot to consider with engine company and um, uh, in this is why we have a diverse group with diverse points of view 
Alberto, God bless you, my son. And uh, the best of luck here. Remember, keep fire in your head and in your heart. And um, stay safe. In this and, 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 re and remember, Bill, we will be visiting the Key Fire Hose facility in Dotham, Alabama, to celebrate the birthday of one of America's greatest firefighting icons. Uh, we'll be we'll be having cake and ice cream, and we'll be you know th we'll be bringing him in in a wheelchair because he is six months older than me and right. highly debilitated. And, well, uh, can I ask you this, boss? Uh, can I wear my birthday suit for that? Yes. Live? Yes. 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 yes that I might not be I, very I, easy on the eyes. Hey, I want to thank our sponsor, <laughs> e Hose. I'm looking forward to uh, in October. Coming up there and see <laughs> yeah, you, dirty dog. And uh, in October, and um, and seeing your folks, and seeing how I've been using your hose for years, and I'd like to see how you make it. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. So until next month, uh, everybody stay healthy, stay hydrated, stay safe. And remember, say a prayer for the police. And when you see a police officer, thank him for what he does or she does. So until next month, stay safe. Thank you.